see you get a straightforward so we are live on the YouTube it was quite difficult so for the audience sorry for the delay um, today you have uh, some relay um, our sessions lately this year has been very interesting so it's the second year that we conduct the, the international cycle of uh, lectures for post-graduation program in agronomy. This has been very, 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 great, very great and very successful. So we have a great audience of all the all the the, uh, the lectures. So today we have the the pleasure to have some. Here you get, uh, uh, drive us uh, uh, in the, the world of underutilized crops and their development for global food security. Someone has a, uh, a very amazing background, and I think he was the first uh, UK student that uh, attended the, the Dobo PhD between Nottingham and Adelaide. So, some Feel free to introduce yourself and take your time. I think everyone is very excited to uh, to hear your your journey and your presentation, your findings. Feel free. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for waking up at 8 a.m. to come and watch my presentation. I'm honored to be here to present to you all. Uh, so as Professor Ribeiro Fierro said, uh, I'm going to be presenting my lecture on underutilized crops and the development for global food security. Um, it's a really, it's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. It was the major topic of my PhD. And so I'm gonna be going through that today. So first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, that was me about two weeks ago doing my graduation at the University of Nottingham. Uh, I currently work as an anaerobic digestion lab analyst at Renico, working in the UK on renewable energy. So that's my current job after I started doing the PhD. But before that, I was studying across the University of Nottingham in the UK and the University of Adelaide in Australia, working on renewable, um, working on underutilized crops. And my PhD title was Vetch as a new protein source for the human diet. But we'll come on to that later. Uh, prior to that, I was still at the University of Nottingham in the UK, and I did my bachelor's in plant science with honours and really enjoyed that grounding in plant biology, which has then brought me into the food industry and everything else that I've been working on. So today, just a bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about. I'm first of all going to give a brief overview on the current crop systems that currently exist in the world and the situation we find ourselves in as agricultural scientists. Um, then I'm going to be talking to you a bit of an introduction to crop diversification, although doing masters and PhDs in this area, I'm sure you're, you've heard this term before. Uh, we're then going to go into the benefits of underutilized crops and why diversification is a really nice solution to global agricultural problems. We're then going to talk about the research challenges that face underutilized crops because um, getting funding is quite a difficult task in this field, but it's something that can be worked on. And then finally, I'm going to go across my PhD and my experience working with underutilized crops and talk about common vetch, which is a leguminous crop grown all over the world that currently isn't eaten very much. So I'll talk about my work to do that. And then finally, I'd love to get your questions and hear about what you want to talk about with me. So as you've heard from most lectures you might receive this year, we have a growing global food demand. Currently in the world, we're expected to reach a population of 2050, a uh, population of 9.9 .9 billion by 2050, uh, which is a huge increase on the over 7 billion we see today. In order to meet this demand and to make sure everyone's fed appropriately, we need to increase our overall food production uh, by 100%, double our food production by 2050, which is a really monumental task, but that's something that we're going to embrace and work with moving forward as scientists and as agronomists. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. At the same time, as these challenges face us, we also have the impacts of climate change causing the current global food system to be impacted negatively um, by aspects that come with climate change, 
So the big ones we're seeing at the moment across Europe, obviously, are increased wildfires and droughts, but also then in India, we're seeing increased flooding and all these aspects together start to impact our ability to produce enough food. So the impacts on agriculture primarily are we see increased amounts of disease due to crops struggling with stress and therefore their resilience to pests and disease decreases. We observe lower yields. So essentially as our ability to maintain optimal levels for plants declines, the crops are unable to actually grow to their full capacity and therefore we grow less food on the same land. And then finally, due to potentially lower soil quality, but also poor growth, we actually see the nutritive quality of the foods we grow decline. So all these three factors capital to couple together actually cause a real issue for agriculture. And it makes the, the challenge of doubling our food production that bit, bit more hard. So the current situation we have and our current reliance um, on agricultural systems consists of 10 staple crops that we grow in huge quantities around the world. The three primary top ones are maize and corn, uh, which produces the number one amount of food, followed this by rice and then wheat. And the paper back in 2014, it was shown that uh, in 2011 alone, white wheat, rice and maize uh, was grown on 40% of total arable land in the world. And that fueled over 50% of human caloric intake. So a huge amount of pressure on these three main crops to produce a huge amount of calories to maintain our current food systems. Now, what you'll notice from this list here, the top 10, is that most of them are starchy grain crops uh, and, and starchy uh, tuber crops, such as cassava and potatoes. There's only one leguminous crop within that, and that's soybean. And soybean, actually, this 241 million tons produced worldwide that year, um, the majority of that goes to feeding animals, which then goes to feeding us protein. So actually, these, these crops as a whole have a relatively low protein content, which means that protein consumption on the whole from these staple crops and these calories is actually quite low. So how do we reach this situation? How did this come about? Well, initially, with the start of agriculture, we experienced a high amount of global plant diversity. And then as agriculture progressed and people started to domesticate certain species, we started to see a pressure of artificial selection, which caused species that were beneficial to humans to be selected, whether that be for food or medicine or for construction, such as trees. And these were experienced, these experienced a certain amount of pressure which caused many crops and many plant species to be pushed down into being widely cultivated and extensively studied. And that's led to the staple crops we see today, those 10 that I just mentioned. This is really good in terms of we now have some highly developed, high yielding crops that feed a lot of people. But the issue with this is we've now basically, uh, we've put all our eggs into a very small basket, which means we're now subject to disruption from many places such as disease, climate breakdown. And it means that our crop systems are less stable and less secure than they would have been if we had a wider tool belt. The other consequence of having a high amount of crops into um, being, you know, a wide amount of crops being fun funneled into the staple crops power pipeline here is that many species became underutilized. And so they became, they're genetically more diverse because there's more of them, but they're not as high yielding, they're not as um, productive as perhaps these staple crops. So over the past you know, number of decades, uh, the, current, the current approach was to try and improve staple crops further by bringing novel genes from these underutilized crop varieties into the staple crops. Uh, one of the big ones you can look at is the Green Revolution where wheat uh, was actually grown very tall, um, two meters tall, if not more. And then by crossbreeding it with wild varieties, we were able to reduce the height of the wheat and we we're able to significantly increase the amount of yield we get from wheat and the amount that gets uh, grown and harvested. Uh, so that was a benefit of that. It also means um, that as a, uh, a tool belt, in terms of a pantry of genes we can use, it's rather wide. The issue with this is though, that as we try and increase staple crops more and more, the incremental increases of production we get and the increases in research um, in terms of yields 
decre decreases, so it's diminishing returns. So that's an issue we're currently facing in terms of agricultural science, and it's worth investigating how we can change that. And that's where diversification of crops comes in and utilizing underutilized crops further. So there's some real potential benefits to crop diversification. One of the main ones, and the main theme here really, is by diversifying our tool belt that we have available, we're able to increase our resilience in terms of global agriculture. So as you can see here, by uh, diversifying our crops, we're able to increase pest and disease management, we're able to make our food security stronger, we're able to maintain our income stability, so we're less subject to fluctuations in climate and with harvests, uh, and that also comes into climate change resilience. So agriculturally, there's so many reasons to diversify crops. And that was actually put to a number of farmers in this next study. So this was a really interesting study from 2020 that looked essentially into the benefits of all diversification practices, including reducing tillage, inoculation, organic farming, it led to all diversification of agricultural practices against crop diversification. And overall, you can see diversification has a huge impact uh, on people's perception of these four categories. So they looked into soil facility, crop yield, nutrient cycling, a number of different and really important factors to agriculture. What they asked the farmers was, do you think that this particular practice, so for instance, crop diversification, do you believe it's increased uh, the factor or has had a positive effect on the factor that we've asked you? So does it have a positive impact on soil facility? And as you can see, out of all these different factors, including organic amendment, reduced tillage, inoculation, crop diversification had the highest net positive um, result across all categories, and it had the most benefits across all categories. Because when you look at inoculation, it only benefits yield. And then when we look at things like, um, when we look at uh, reduced tillage, it actually has a negative effect on yield whereas diversification across the board appeared to have positive agro agronomic benefits to the farmer. So there's a lot of reasons, a lot of positives to doing crop diversification and also utilizing, this could be within crop rotation. And this also means that underutilized crops get a real look into. The other benefit of crop diversification, increasing the number of crops we use within a crop rotation, but also utilizing underutilized crops is that it leads to a diversified consumption pattern in those areas. So the people who grow lots of different types of food, they intake a lot of different types of crops. That as a result means you achieve a mixed diet, a balanced diet really easily, as compared to diets which rely on a monocrop such as wheat or rice, where they're not getting, they might get a really high amount of prote uh, protein or starch, but they don't get a lot of micronutrients, which are really important. Currently, there's a real impact and a real focus on combating malnutrition. And a lot of people think that has to do with calories. A big part of that is also micronutrient deficiencies, such as zinc, such as iron, but also things like vitamin A. And so by having this uh, diversification of the, in of the crops being produced and also those being eaten in those communities, we tend to eliminate a lot of these nutrient intakes. There was a really good study produced in 2021 uh, that actually looked at nutritional stability in relation to crop diversity in different regions. And what they eventually looked at, you can see the amount of crop diversity is being shown on the x-axis here, so higher crop diversity over to the right, and then the nutritional stability, which is the amount, the ability of a system to maintain the nutrition is increasing here on the y-axis. Now, as you can see, it's showing here that essentially the curves represent that increased crop diversity increases nutritional stability. And also this tends to be more applicable to different regions of the world. So within Europe and Oceania, which includes Australia, shown in black and blue here, lower diversity um, actually achieves, um, lower diversity is needed to achieve a good nutritional stability. However, in potentially, in potentially in countries which have less um, ability to maintain food supply, such as Asia, the Americas, uh, or even parts of Africa, the need for diversification actually increases to maintain nutritional stability. So you can see here we've gone from seven up to 11, 13, and 16 species required for crop diversity. So in essence, crop diversity is really important to maintain nutritional stability.
as just shown from this. So a lot of benefits to diversification of crops. Now, some of the research challenges associated with researching underutilized crops and crop diversification is much of the research funding aligns with total crop, out, crop output worldwide. So as you saw earlier, there's 10 species that are highly produced worldwide, and they tend to get the majority of the funding, mainly because they produce a lot of the calories. It makes sense. If you're going to have something that is dominant in the field of agriculture and dominant in the calorie, in the calorie output worldwide, it makes sense to put your funding towards that on the surface level. Um, however, what this does lead to is there's a, a disparity between the funding of the staple crops and the funding of underutilized crops. And so because there's only 10 staple crops, what you find is the underutilized crops, which there are several thousand of, if not tens of thousands, the research funding for them gets spread out over a wide amount of uh, species, which means that overall, the benefits of underutilized crop research is diminished. It's spread out so widely that we can't get a full benefit to compete with staple crops. Um, so a lot of studies have actually gone into looking at these thousands of species and looking into which ones have the most promise for research going forward. And what they found in a lot of meta-analysis was that crops that produce high amounts of energy but were underutilized, such as sweet potato, uh, broad bean and lentils, required increased research focus um, to make them plant resilient and nutrition, nutritionally secure in comparison to staple crops. But what really needs focusing on are crops that are incredibly underutilized but have the most benefit overall. So this is another graph in that study. Uh, what it's essentially showing is that um, nutrient output, as that increases, you tend to get a higher number of publications overall. So there's a nice positive correlation between nutrient output and number of publications. As you can see this top end, very high energy producing crops in the region will likely have more publications focused on them. What you do tend to find though, is a lot of high energy crops down here that actually fall out the loop and they have no publications or very few associated with them or very little. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of them, which means these are ones that are good to focus on going forward. And that's what my PhD focused on. It, it focused on one of these crops down here called common vetch, which can then be brought forward to become one that hopefully has high numbers of publications, um, but still has a high calorie content. So this brings us on to a case study of research in underutilized crops. And this is more about my PhD research. So, I'm going to be discussing common vetch or vicious sativa as a protein source for the human diet as an underutilized crop. So let me first introduce it. So this picture on the right is common vetch or vicious sativa. It's among the FAO or the Food and Agriculture Organization's 11 most important primary pulses. But out of those 11, it's one of the few that isn't consumed by humans. Um, and there's a number of reasons why it's still very important. It's incredibly drought resistant as a crop, which is excellent for the climate crisis we're currently facing. It's able to survive in some studies up to 21 days with no water before water being added and it spring back to life. Very important in highly sporadic weather systems that we're experiencing at the moment where rainfall is less predictable. The crop itself is leguminous, which means it fixes nitrogen in the soil and allows for soil remediation, which is fantastic for uh, within crop rotation systems. And then it's also highly nutritious. So it contains 24 to 32% crude protein, and then it contains only 1.5 to 2.7% lipids, which is really low. And those lipids are um, unsaturated fats primarily. I think it's like uh, three quarters of them are unsaturated fats. It's currently used as a ruminant feed, as forage. It feeds on the uh, cows and sheep feed on the green matter, um, just as a grazing thing, uh, grazing, uh, grazing substance. And it's also used as green manure. So it's actually ploughed back into the soil uh, before rotation. And in the soil, it decomposes and releases its nitrogen into the soil for the subsequent crops to be used. So it's a really handy crop. So why isn't it being utilised? Um, it's not grown at all around the world in comparison to even other leguminous crops. So as you can see here, the dominant ones are chickpeas and lupins. These are um, grown for edible um, 
edible crops. So in this case, soy is quite low because edible soy is actually very, very low. And vetches here are incredibly low cultivated, only 1% of legumes produced. Main reason for this is the vetch seeds themselves contain neurotoxins um, that are really potent and quite nasty. So the two toxins that are present are beta-thioalanine, or BCA, as I'll be referring it to for the rest of the lecture, and a dipeptide called gamma-glutamyl beta-thioalanine, or GBCA. In the seed, uh, GBCA represents about 2.6% of the dry matter, and BCA represents about 0.9% of the dry matter. 2.6% uh, dry matter actually makes it the dominant protein within the seed itself, or the dominant dipeptide within the seed itself, which means it's at really high concentrations. Um, so essentially, the way this toxin works is you've got a cyoalanine, um, sorry, you've got an alanine molecule, which bonds to a cyanide, cyanine, a cyanide uh, ion, and then that molecule actually gets stored as BCA bonds to glutamine, it actually gets stored as gamma glutamyl beta cyanide or GBCA. So this is a storage molecule that takes this and becomes a more stable molecule with the plant. This is an especially top, both are especially toxic. The GBCA in particular is very potent. Uh, it's very toxic to monogastrics, so things with one stomach. And there's plenty of studies conducted on rats, chickens, a variety of different animals. And what it causes essentially is rapid neuron firing and the symptoms are hyperactivity, convulsions, and eventually death due to those rapid neuronal firings. Uh, it's quite a nasty toxin in that way. There's a number of different studies showing how much we could feed vetch to different animals. But unfortunately, um, yeah, as you can see here, ruminants and lambs and things with multiple stomachs, unlimited amounts uh, is the consensus. However, as you go into pigs and chickens and things with one stomach, uh, the amount you can feed is about 30%, 25%, or even just 10%, which is really low. And it'd be nice to feed higher inclusions into diets. So you can see here, it's not potent to the point where you eat a seed and it kills you, but you eat en enough of it and it starts to cause some rather nasty uh, symptoms. So on a molar basis, both toxins produce quite similar symptoms. Um, one of the early hypotheses was that BCA, being uh, an alanine bonding to a cyanide molecule, might be that it just releases cyanide, and that causes the death that way, as traditional cyanide poisoning would. However, the cyanide itself didn't cause any inhibitory effect on NADH dehydrogenase or cytochrome C oxidase. These are both enzymes that are typically impacted by cyanide release, and essentially the fact that they weren't impacted by the toxin's presence indicates that it's actually likely to be um, the whole molecule interacting and inhibiting processes rather than cyanide itself. So it seems to act as a whole compound. Um, but the understanding of the toxin is pretty limited, which impacts its use as an underutilized crop and, and hopefully its route to utilization. The way the toxins are produced uh, is within the plant and within any typical plant within agriculture, you get this pathway of cysteine converting into bio uh, beta thioalanine as an intermediate, and that gets broken down into asparginine. Um, the really trip typical mechanism across all plant life. Um, and what happens in vetch in particular is we believe that this final enzyme, thioalanine hydratase, is inactive or it's too low levels. Um, there's a number of different ideas, but it doesn't work. And so what happens instead is beta thioalanine builds up. And as because of that would be toxic to the plant itself, Vetch has actually developed uh, an enzyme called guta, um, beta gamma, gamma, guta, yeah, sorry, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, which actually adds a glutamine onto it and becomes gamma glutamyl beta cyanide as a storage molecule that is safe for the plant, but not for stuff that eats it. We're not sure why it's produced this, potentially as an insect deterrent, but it has these toxins in high concentrations. So the long-term solution would be to make a genetic approach and find out how to make a zero-toxin vector industry. And that research is still ongoing in Adelaide. But my research as a food and plant scientist was a bit more different. So my approach is to use post-harvest processing for detoxification. Now, you might be wondering why this is important as a research theme for underutilized crops. Now, because research into the genetics of underutilized crops is so uh, extensive, it's often easier to focus on low-level, uh, already established techniques for making these crops, these underutilized crops, suitable for market. 
And in this case, uh, we have loads of already established techniques. Compared to genetic routes as well, this tends to be more economical and can also be performed at both a local and a commercial scale. So people in the country of origin can do it, but also the people in industry, as um, you can see down here, you can do it in very high-end, high-scale production, um, and that makes it very useful. It also has some potential nutritional benefits, which we'll come on to later. These processing methods can often increase the nutrients available as you eat it. The current processing methods used on vets were found to not be sufficient. So boiling with refreshing liquid each time, soaking, acid treatment, and autoclaving seeds didn't reduce the toxin to suitable levels, um, which makes it quite resilient to thermal heat and other types of methods. So essentially, um, they eliminated the toxins, some of them as well. But what happened is, was that as we eliminated the toxins with these methods, the seeds lost nutrition and they lost a lot of nutrition. Most of the soluble carbohydrates and proteins were lost, which means that if you feed it to an animal, that animal can't produce mass, which makes it a useless animal feed and a useless food crop. And so the goal essentially is to find a method which is able to remove the toxin and make it safe, but without destroying the nutrition of why you're using this underutilized crop in the first place. So my project in an overview uh, to make vetch as an underutilized crop safe for human consumption and make it a staple crop was first of all to understand the vetch neurotoxicity because there was so little research done about that up to that point. The second part was looking at a new method of fermentation on vetch toxins and seeing if that would impact how these toxins remain in the seed. And then finally, vetch hadn't been eaten before. It hadn't been documented. And we want to know whether vetch, because it had these toxins, had developed some really nasty flavors that made it inedible, not very nice to consumers, because there's no point making a crop that no one wants to eat because it tastes so bad or smells so bad. So those are the three aspects of my thesis. I'm going to go through a few of them in light detail. Um, keep in mind, I must say, and I'll come to this in the second middle section, uh, essentially, I can't talk about the middle part of my thesis just due to um, some embargoes, and we're getting some patents going through on that. But I can talk about the other sections. I'd love, I'd love to discuss a few aspects of that in the Q&A session. So what I essentially want to do is look into vetch toxicity in neuronal cells as a model to see how toxicity occurs in vetch. So the aims of this part of the project was to find a high-throughput tissue culture model for working out how these toxins of vetch worked. So establishing an assay other than animal trials to speed through development of vetch as a food crop. We then wanted to look into how GBCA and BCA worked, and through that we used proteomics analysis on those neuronal cells. And this would potentially highlight some biomarkers for vetch toxicity, which can then be used to trace back in, fu in the future whether vetch has redeveloped its toxicity, or whether it has toxins within the food stuff. Um, which would be really useful for the eventual food industry. So this is the cells we used. Uh, we used some human neuronal cells, which are SHSY5 cells, human neuroblastoma cells. They start as this kind of lumpy cell here, and eventually, as you add different compounds, they start to become actual brain cells and form networks, which is really cool. I think I have a quick video. Let me see if I can get the... Uh... So here we go. So this is them developing over the course of three days. I'm hoping you can see this. Um, essentially what happens is they start to separate out from each other and they form synapses, much like your brain was when you were first developing as a baby. And so as they develop like this, you can see here they form networks and they start to, importantly, start, they start to produce proteins um, that human neuronal cells do which is really useful as a model for human neurotoxicity and also for animal neurotoxicity. So you can see them starting to stretch. It's really dramatic, the difference it makes over 72 hours. It's a really useful bit, um, really useful model system. So you can see here it's made a really nice neural network and produces lots of neuronal proteins. The way we monitored this was with a kit called the Incosite, which is the microscope and an incubator and a camera all in one. 
essentially what we wanted to track was how the toxin influenced neuronal cell, whether it did influence neuronal cells. And so these are some cells um, as before, which I then applied 50 millimolar of the BCA toxin onto, and you'll see the impacts and the degradation of these cells as they go forward. So this is a really potent neurotoxin. We just apply it directly to the cells using the pipette, and you should see them start to retract and really start to feel the damage from the toxins that are present in batch. As you can see as well, they start to globulize. They become these tiny little specks. Um, yeah, this is when they really start to pull apart. So as you can see there, uh, some pretty dead cells, uh, which is a good indication of the toxins are quite bad for neuronal health. Uh, we do use a control as well to make sure that water doesn't affect them, um, which is great. So the system does work just for toxins. And we did try other tom compounds that were based from the plant, which wouldn't be toxic to neuronal cells. So a lot of controls took place here. What we found essentially was um, influencing, um, the basically applying different concentrations of toxin cause a degradation in cell viability. So I'm just going to turn on the pointer. So essentially, what you can see here is at the highest concentrations, the cell confluence, which is the amount of space the cells take up on the picture, declines significantly. And then over time, with the as you can decrease concentrations, particularly at 50 millimolar here in the orange, you can see here that it starts to fall later on in the process. We also do an endpoint analysis, so we see uh, how viable the cells are with metabolism. And as you can see here, at 50 millimolar concentrations the viability has decreased significantly compared to the control, but also 40 millimolar. And then at 60 millimolar, they're really struggling. And that reflects the data up here. So this is for BCA. For GBCA, the larger toxin, there's a real nice gradation of a real nice dose response with the toxin. So you can see here that at the highest concentration, GBCA has a huge impact on the health of the cells, and they really, really shrivel and decline. And this is reflected again with the um, viability of the cells metabolically. So more toxin equals more cell death and more cell damage. So now we have a dose response curve. We were able to find the LD50, which is the point at which half the cells had died. And for both, we believe that based on this measurement here, but also this measurement here, half the cells were dead at 48 hours from a 50 millimolar concentration. So then we could do loads of analysis on that and find out the root cause of the toxicity. So we did this experiment across the um, neuroblastoma cells, which I've shown previously, the model cells, human. But we also wanted to test it on primary mouse neurons just to make sure that worked. And we did see an impact there as well. Um, that was taken from the brains of these little mouse fetuses. Um, and that's a really standard study technique. So we essentially tested the toxin on both, and it was both very toxic. Um, so it, it shows that, yeah, it's a neurotoxin that works across most neuronal models. We also wanted to check very briefly if this could be used as a tool, this model system could be used as a tool in um, breeding screening. So essentially, if we try and breed a no-toxin vetch, um, does, uh, we make an extract of that vetch and squirt it onto the cells, does it have a similar dose response to that of the pure vetch? Because then if I make a zero-toxin vetch lime, and I squirt the, um, the vetch extract onto the um, onto the neural cells, we shouldn't see any impact. If there's no if there's no toxins, there should be no impact, and we should see zero. So we looked at the reliability of the standards versus our vetch extracts. So you can see here our dose response curve using the toxic GBCA on neural cells. And then we looked essentially at filtered extracts in red versus unfiltered extracts. Um, and when we filter the extracts to the point where there's just a toxin and minimal proteins, we saw that actually there was a pretty good, as you can see here, this is, an, um, yeah, this is a concentration of 4.2 millimolar, and it's pretty representative of our standard curve with 5 millimolar. 
So this could be really useful in the future for breeding research on breeding zero toxin veg lines because you can test the extracts on our model and see whether it still contains toxic concentrations to neuronal cells. So that's really cool. Once we found the point at which we wanted to work with, we took 48 hour samples at 58, 50 millimolar for all toxins and a control. And then we ran something called tandem mass tag proteomics. Um, it's quite a complex proteomics technique. Essentially what happens is you take all the proteins in a sample and you tag them with an individual tag. So for instance, uh, this was one, two, and three. And then what you do is you pull all those proteins from every sample together and you run an LCMS at NAS. So what happens then is there's no bias, there's no um, issue of retention time, but what you can do is you can track the individual tags on every protein. So it's a really accurate way of looking at proteomics. It's a really useful technique. So what we can look at is what proteins uh, are upregulated and downregulated from toxin application. And from that, you get an idea of what's going on in a neuronal cell. This is the first time this was done. What we found was when you looked at BCA toxins versus control, uh, which are cells with no toxin, we found 99 significantly dysregulated proteins. So they were ones that we were interested in because that could be the root cause of what's happening to the neuronal cell upon toxin addition. And then for GBCA, the more potent toxin, we found 162 significantly dysregulated proteins, um, likely due to the fact that GBCA had a bigger effect in terms of toxin um, dose, so it actually caused more damage, which means that more proteins were regulated. Um, but yeah, it gives a really good starting point in finding out what's going on. You can then plug these in uh, with bioinformatics into some gene ontology databases. And what that does is it takes all the proteins from here, these individual proteins, and it maps out all the cellular components, um, all the molecular function and biological processes that were dysregulated. Um, because every single protein in the human genome or you know, every single protein in humans is classified into different types of use. And so this was really cool because it came back with all sorts of nice ideas as to what GBCA and BCA toxins might influence. So the main standouts for us really was that BCA itself caused a huge amount of issues with DNA replication. Um, as you can see down here, we had issues with DNA replication, we had issues with unwinding, we had issues, lots of stuff to do with um, regulation, break stand, uh, double strand break repair. And that means that BCA could be causing an impact on mitosis. Um, which would cause a cell to basically to try and repair itself. And if that continues, the cell would apoptose. So that's a really interesting application for the toxin. In terms of GBCA, um, we also found, and this is DNA damage, most likely. And from GBC, uh, GBCA, we saw a really high amount, again, of mitosis focused um, significant differences, and which means that, again, it's probably focusing on mitosis and causing that process to be impacted by the toxin. So the key findings of this study, and this is due to be published fairly shortly, is that BCA is sensitive at neuronal cells at about 50 millimolar concentrations in this particular, in the, in this particular uh, model. And essentially, BCA was associated with DNA damage and protein translation issues when it's applied to neuronal cells. So that could be a really nice starting point for looking into what's going on. GBCA, on the other hand, um, caused a huge amount of disruption to mitosis and cell cycle, and that's something we're really interested in. And it was sensitive at higher concentration, at lower concentration, sorry, than BCA was as a more potent neurotoxin. Future direction of this uh, is basically looking into how GBCA inputs cell cycle, and we have looked into this um, through cell cycle flow cytometry, so looking at what points in the cell cycle. Um, GBCA causes the pausing of mitosis. That gives us a really good impact as to what's going on, even further detail. Um, we also want to look into more of these proteins that are highlighted because they're useful biomarkers. So rather in the future, rather than looking at every single protein in the genome and the proteome, we can actually look instead at individual proteins as biomarkers and saves a lot of money and time, which makes it very useful for future research. You can use Western blots and other methods, which is great. And then finally, the future direction of this will be using zero toxin lines, animal trials to see if we've got a, a zero toxin crop. The second part, unfortunately, I can't share with you. I've had words with my uh, supervisor and my university. 
and we're pushing for a pattern on this process for, uh, at the moment. So um, I was going to talk about the effect of fermentation on vector anti-nutritional factors, so how we were aiming to remove the toxins via processing, um, but unfortunately that's currently going through a lot of IP address um, issues, um, which is exciting because we've got research worth talking about and worth, you know, worth investing in, um, but unfortunately I can't share it with you today, which is a real shame. But we'll move on, and I'm sure some questions come up which I can answer about that. The final bit um, of the work I did was looking at volatiles and flavour of vetch using these processing methods that we discussed earlier and processing vetch using industrial methods. Uh, we actually got this published in Food Chemistry, which is a really good thing for me. I was the first paper uh, put out as a, as a primary author. Um, essentially, I'll just give you a little background as to food flavour, because I know as agricultural students, this might not be um, the number one thing you come across every day. So food flavour is essentially um, when chemical components are called volatiles are sensed by receptors in the mouth and nose. And also these are released when you digest, when you swallow food and chew food, you um, get these um, food flavour compounds come back and that builds a whole network of, of food flavour volatiles. Um, essentially, flavour works via um, the food you take in, uh, the food you smell, sorry, uh, through your nose. That is uh, part of food flavour perception but also you get it retronasally. So when you swallow food, the gases actually go back up through your nasal cavity um, and that causes more volatiles to come up and you actually get more smells from that. Um, you can test this through a GCMS, testing the gases coming off the first bit. So you can test the volatiles coming off the food product itself, but also as, as my supervisor Ian Fist shows here, um, you can actually take the food in through your mouth and you can catch that retronasal volatiles by putting a tube up your nose called the MS nose and uh, it's a funky bit of kit. I haven't used it myself. I'm sure it's not very comfortable, um, but it's a really useful bit of, of kit for testing uh, total food volatiles. Now, why are food volatiles important? Well, essentially there's 5,000 to 10,000 sensitive volatiles that we as humans are sensitive to as aromas. Um, tastes are pretty common. Uh, there's sweet, bitter, salt, savour, savoury and, and sour, but there's also a few more. Just people say metal might be one. Um, and there's other aspects that come into food flavour. Now, why is food flavour important for underutilised crops? Um, because they're underutilised, people don't know what they taste or smell like. A lot of crops are, are eaten by small communities, which is great, and they appreciate the fla flavour and, and, and uh, flavours associated with it. But in terms of commercial viability, this, these crops need to be accessible and appealing to the wider public and the wider society. So it's really important when we propose these crops that they don't taste bad. Um, and when it comes to vetch in particular, because it has toxins associated with it, and toxicity is often associated with bitter flavours, as you can see here, there's an issue where it might still retain those even after processing. So it's really important to look into this when you want to develop an underutilised crop. Aroma volatiles themselves um, actually have different thresholds at which they activate. So if it's got a very low threshold, for instance, um, uh, 2-meoxyhexylpyrazine has a super low threshold. For, you know, I, could, I could put this in the corner of the next room um, and you'd be able to smell it from here. Whereas pyrazine, you'd have to have a huge amount to smell. Um, and that represents itself from this headline where essentially a small amount of gas leak in France was able to be smelt all the way across the English Channel in the UK um, because it was such a high potent sub, you know, substance. So it's important for us to measure both volatiles that are present in the substance to see if they're, they're nasty substances, but also to make sure that the thresholds that are there are below um, that that causes um, you know, bad odours. As you can see here, finally, different concentrations of the volatiles actually change how we perceive the volatiles. So this is for uh, transnonanol, essentially at low concentration, it's woody, smelling to me and you, slightly more fatty, a little bit more than that, becomes really nasty and no one wants to smell that. And at the highest concentration, if I really gave you loads of it, it smells of cucumber. Um, so it's important for us to monitor the concentrations for that reason, because it means we can interpret how things might smell and might taste. So the aims of my paper here was to investigate interspecies and interspecies variation of aroma volatiles within vetch. So there's loads of vetches, uh, common vetches. Uh, and we want to look into the aromas and flavor across all of those. And the idea was, can we detect some nasty flavors and smells 
using GCMS? So can we find these, identify them, and, and talk about how they could potentially be dealt with? We also made some processing methods. So we were able to boil them, soak them, do all these different methods. And we wanted to see if that had an impact on the flavor chemistry of vetch, make sure, you know, did it, did it make it taste better? Or did it make it you know, taste worse? That would be interesting. So what we first looked at was the inter and intraspecies volatile variation. So we took four subspecies, four variants of vetch, four varieties of vetch, and one different species of hairy vetch. So as you can see here on the left, um, we've got three different, two different species of commercial um, common vetch, and we had one uh, variety that was an ancient variety. So we had Sagittalis, which is from a very small seeds, very small horticultural variety that isn't grown very often. Um, and we brought that into the mix. And we also brought an out, so out, outlier of Latigo, which is hairy vetch, different species entirely. And you can see the divergence here. So you can see that uh, Vista Tiva and Vista uh, Amelia come down this branch. So you've got uh, all the Vista Tivas over here. And then Vista Velosa is pretty genetically divergent being on that northern branch. We dried them, we ground them to a powder, and we ran them through the GCMS. We wanted to see what the volatiles came back and what the dominant volatiles of vetch were, which will tell us whether they had good or bad flavors. We ran that for a PCA here. And what that pulled off for us was that the dominant five compounds of Vischer generally was 2 pentamfurol, benzyl alcohol, benzyl aldehyde, one octanfriol, and one hexanol. And a lot of these were off flavors. So one octanfriol in particular has a really, uh, is, is quite a characteristic of off flavors, and these aren't all desirable, which is a shame. Uh, especially things that have beanie aromas aren't desirable to consumers. So we've got these five compounds, potentially, potentially they could be at low levels, and that would be fine, and no one would notice. So that's what we wanted to check into next. So we then looked into, um, so we had these, these compounds in mind. We wanted to look into as well, overall, what, quantity of compounds are being produced. And so as you can see here for the commercial varieties, this is showing uh, the concentration of aroma volatiles um, across these different um, common vetches, but also the hairy vetch. As you can see for the commercial varieties of both species, they're pretty low, relatively, uh, relatively low con overall concentrations of aroma compounds, which means that, you know, that could, that could mean there's a fresh hold, which get meat, you know, there's below uh, having off flavors or perceptible off flavors. However, for Sagittalis, you can see here the amount of alcohols and aldehydes and everything was enormous, you know, almost double everything else, but more than double all the other varieties, which means that potentially um, there's a gene in, in the wild variety, in the, in the Sagittalis, that causes a huge amount of volatiles to be produced. So that could be a really useful breeding tool in the future uh, for understanding how volatiles are formed within vetch and whether we can influence those to make vetch more appealing to consumers. We then looked into um, a range of different processing methods that are commonly used for legumes. So it looks into uh, splitting the seed down the middle and removing the outer holes, soaking, germination, uh, to see if sprouting would do anything at all, microwaving as a heat treatment. We looked into fungal fermentation through tempeh, which was really cool. So that's a fungal fermentation using Rhizopus oligosporus that forms these blocks. And then we also looked into bacterial fermentation. This one, this fermentation is from Indonesia. This one, uh, Nato, Bacillus subtilis Nato is from Japan. Um, and what it does is it basically causes uh, these formation of these strands. I hope you can see this for this small video. It causes the formation of these bacterial strands um, as its fermented product. Um, it has a quite strong smell. I'll put it that much. Um, but yeah, we tried all these methods to see what the influence on volatiles would be. Essentially, what we saw overall was that by processing vetch, uh, no matter what the processing method, most of them, particularly uh, germination and natto and tempeh fermentation, significantly increased the amount, the total concentration of volatiles within vetch products. So as you can see here, for all varieties, tempeh fermentation shown in this stripe bar caused a huge increase in volatiles. Probably due to the fact you've, you're putting, inputting a new um, microorganism into the mix, which is producing all these different compounds um, and doing a lot of dynamic processes. Um, more in depth, though, was looking into how it influenced different compounds in each process. So I know this is quite a complicated PCA, but essentially it's trying to group different compounds with different processes. But I'll give you the rundown. So essentially, by removing the outer hole of vetch, 
Um, we start to detect loads of esters and pyrroles, um, which are typically contributing fruity aromas, which aren't undesirable. We believe that increasing the surface area actually increased uh, the amount of oxygen that could reach the seed and increase the oxidation, which typically produces these compounds. So not a negative in terms of a process method for flavor development and improving flavor. Soaking the seed did cause a really significant increase in one octan friol, which is one of the five dominant compounds uh, that we detected and we, we've cataloged. Um, this does suggest a potentially a wild fermentation process that activates when the seeds are soaked or able to hydrate, um, which wouldn't be appealing as an array compound or potentially appealing, but that needs looking into. In terms of the more complex methods, uh, here's another PCA. As you can see here, uh, this is pulling, uh, this is temp T is for tempeh, which is the fungal fermentation. As you can see here, it's really skewing the, um, the graphs on the right hand side because it's, cool, you know, it's producing so many compounds. So essentially, the tempeh, the tempeh fermentation produces significant alcohol content. However, what we did notice was it reduced the dominant one octan free oil from the catalogued uh, compounds. It significantly reduced it, which means that potentially tempeh fermentation, while there might be more alcohols, would have less um, potential off flavors than raw vetch, which is good. Natto fermentation, which is the bacterial fermentation, uh, increased pyrazine production. And we believe that's potentially due to mild reaction and striker degradation mechanisms. Um, that's interesting. Whether or not they're off flavors or not needs to be looked into with a panel, but that's, that's interesting. Microwaving the seed produces a lot of oxidative products, um, likely due to the heat causing oxidative breakdown of unsaturated fatty acids. Um, so aldehydes, potentially off flavors, could be introduced by the, yeah, by the um, microwaving. And then germination produces lots of dimethyl sulfide, which is the classic uh, production of germination in plants. And essentially that's got a green aroma, something too outlandishly off. So the key findings of this study was we identified 95 volatiles, both raw and processed vetch that are of interest to us moving forward with new studies. Uh, we described the compounds that are characteristic of vetch for the first time, which is a really useful tool belt going forward for future work. We used um, each species variation and we discovered that had a huge amount of abundance in wild varieties versus commercial varieties. So that's a really good tool belt for your future use. And then finally, uh, the off flavor one octan friol, the concentration was significantly decreased after tempeh fermentation. So our future directions uh, would be understanding how removing these toxins affects the vetch volatiles and linking the two studies I've talked about today together. We also would like to run uh, GCO, which is the one that goes up your nose. The, um, we'd like to run that essentially on and see what actually is bioactive to see what flavors humans detect and how they're perceived. And then finally, when we have a zero toxin vetch, it'd be good to run a sensory panel and actually see what vetch tastes like from a perspective of people like you and me, because having a machine run it, we don't expect to it. And finally, optimizing these processing uh, for industrial scale, that can be done, I'm sure, in the future, it's done for loads of crops. So essentially, throughout the project, um, we established a robust cell culture system for GBCA and BCA toxicity. We were the first to use proteomics techniques towards determining GBCA amount of action and confirm some of the studies done before. Um, we investigated vetch processing worthy enough for commercialization. There's something in the pipeline, it will come through, but it's exciting. And then we also have looked into uh, developing novel post harvesting processing methods for vetch. First time that's been done and documented. And the first ever description of volatile profiles for vetch. Nice thing about underutilized crops, if you do research in it, you're the first for a lot of stuff, which is a bonus to doing it. In summary, what we've covered today is uh, we've looked into the dynamics of current crop systems. We've looked into the potential crop diversification in the face of climate change, but also in terms of global food security. And we looked into that untapped benefit that the underutilized crops can survive, uh, provide. It's all about research funding and the caveats with that. We also looked into underutilized crops, plant resilience, improved nutrition. And I've talked to you about vetch for a long time. I hope you've enjoyed that little insight to my project. Uh, I'd like to thank the Cell Lab, the Gex Lab in Adelaide, but also the Food Science Department at the University of Nottingham and all my supervisors for all the support in this project. And here are the references. You can look over these later if you need some of the papers that come through. They're really, really useful. Um, and I'll open up to you guys as a Q&A session. I'd love to hear your questions. Thanks, Amanda.
Thank you very much, Sam. It was really amazing. I, I, this is. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Should I go back onto yeah. the? Um, should I go back onto the Streamyard? Yeah. This is this is amazing because um, you know you did a lot of work during your journey, isn't it? You involved you involved a lot of things. And I, I got quite excited about the, the, the fermentation beads and the flavor because it's, my, it's in part of my passion. And of course, the kind of uh, cell that you use as a, a model was very interesting. So I, I have a few questions later, but I think we should start with, with the yeah, audience. Yeah, of course. Can everyone have... see me okay? Can everyone hear me okay in the Q&A session? Yeah. So oh, it, it always appears there. So. He went to he, he does this work for us is amazing. So what is John uh, John Jones that uh, that Silva he asked, what is the biggest food security challenge in the world? Oh, thanks for your question, Joe Jones. Um, it's a big question, very broad question. I would potentially say the biggest food security challenge in the world right now is uh, potentially land degradation. So one of the biggest ones we see at the moment is it's all well and good us saying solutions that would impact um, food production and increasing food production. But what we're seeing all over the world at the moment is the area of arable land that's available is rapidly decreasing. And what that means is that not only are we having to think of new solutions to improve production, but also um, the, the, the amount of space we have to do it in is hugely declined. So I think stemming that in the bud and trying to minimize degradation, particularly of um, trying to improve agricultural practices to maintain soil productivity, maintain soil um, vitality, and make sure it doesn't blow away. Desert, desert, desertification is becoming a big problem in parts of South America, in parts of Africa, and it's becoming more a problem all over the world. So I think potentially maintaining the land we have currently is the biggest food security challenge before we move on to then going, well, how can we maximize that space we have? We have one more from Aline Cunha. Uh, she says, uh, local cultures uh, are an alternative for source for food security. What can we do to not lose these local cultures and all the traditional knowledge, knowledge of their cultivation and use? I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, thanks, Aline. I think in terms of local, of course, local cultures for us working on utilized crops, it's the, the first place we find our species that we work with. Um, in fact, it's it's a big part of what we do for science in general. Uh, I've got a colleague who works in finding the genetic um, origin of vetch, and a lot of that that work involves going to local communities and asking them where do you find these wild varieties? Where should we where should we go to find them and incorporating cultures? In terms of um, using them as an alternative source for food security and using that as the ground level, I think education is possibly one of the biggest things um, in terms of incorporating our knowledge of underutilized crops with local community knowledge is really important. A lot of what's happened over the past 30 years is that um, we, we, we as um, you know, purveyors of staple crops have forced other people of local cultures to work with these staple crops like corn and maize, where it might not be suitable for them, and that their crops are likely more adapted to their environment. And so I think it's it's important and it's becoming more prevalent that we recognize that and, and we recognize that going forward. So that way it works at all levels, that diversifying our food chain works at all levels with local communities. So yeah, I think I think it's becoming more prevalent with taking more interest. Um, and I think it's really important. Nice. I know Brasileiro, she asks. Uh, what strategy can we implement to promote the acceptance and adoption of unutilized crops in diets and uh, of population in the population? I think in population diets. Mm. Yeah. Um. Thank you, Ariel. I think in terms of um, how can we promote it? I've worked in a variety of different fields. Um, I've worked in insect protein, and I've experienced this question from an insect protein perspective, but also from an underutilized crop perspective. And I must admit, selling someone an underutilized crop is a lot easier than selling someone insects, which are far outside the realm of what they're used to. But people are getting more interested in where their food comes from. And it also seems like people are getting more interested 
in new forms of food. So cell-based meats are becoming a really hot topic at the moment. People are more interested in climate production, uh, climate change, sorry. And people are more open, it seems, to trying new foods if they know it benefits the environment, but also if they know it's potentially something people are going to talk about if it's interesting. Being interesting is a huge, you know, a huge driver. For instance, over the past 10 years, quinoa has become really big. Chia seeds have become really big. These crops weren't really utilized in the wider public before then, but now they're hugely popular. So I think um, the strategies to be implement, in, in, implemented are public engagement. I think that's really important. But also, um, I think a lot of it's being driven by the public themselves. So I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot harder. It's a lot less of an issue than it was 10, 20 years ago. A lot easier. Right. Everton Bar a question from Everton Barbosa. How can we underutilize how can underutilized crops contribute to diversifying diets and improving nutrition in different regions of the world? I think that's a good question. Yeah, that's a really good one. Um I think what you see as an impact, uh, thanks Everton. I think in terms of um the impact that underutilized crops can have in diversifying diets around the world. Um, the nice bit about researching these crops is we look at all facets of it. So we look at, nutrition's a really big one, we look at underutilized crops. And the more data we have to represent it, and the more the more things we have as a tool belt to know these crops work well in these locations or these conditions, you can not only tailor the crop to suit um, the agricultural conditions, but you can actually suit the crop in a rotation to suit the diets of that area. So if they're deficient in vitamin A, you could choose a crop out of this large array of underutilized crops that can be used in the area to, to combat that. Um, I think what will happen as well is as we use more underutilized crops and more diversifying crops, um, you'll find that the nutrition as a whole will increase because different plants accumulate and, and store different micronutrients a lot better than others. And so by spreading that out, you improve the diet overall. So yeah, it will help a lot. Nice, the next one. Another one from Everton oh. Barbosa. Uh, what are the cu uh, cultural and awareness? Uh, I can't pronounce this. Is it Hondos? <laughs> uh, yeah, I cannot pronounce that word. Uh, so can, you, can, can, you, can you understand that one? Yeah. So yeah. what are the cultural oh, and awareness hurdles that need, to un un that need to be overcome to encourage consumption of underutilized crops on a global scale? The big awareness one this might be a, a bit of a stretch on the question but the big awareness um hurdles in also the agri agronomic community in knowing that we need to focus on underutilized crops and that funding needs to be allocated to underutilized crops um it's it's hard because as a as an academic you're hunting for funding all the time and it's a lot easier for me to work in a wheat-based product uh, project and get funding from giant agricultural companies uh because they want more Wheat yield, it makes sense. So, in terms of the cultural, um, uh, in terms of a hurdle there, it makes sense for those companies to realize that diversification is good for them. Good for them in terms of they'll have more products to sell, um, but also you know it impacts um, what can be done in the awareness. If more scientists work on these less crops, there's more awareness because there's more public engagement. Uh, cultural hurdles. I think actually it's sort of the reverse. So the cultures eating underutilized crops currently. Um, that they, you know, they are fully embraced in eating underutilized crops. However, it's getting the general consensus of eating underutilized crops um, that needs to be overcome. So that's probably the big one. It's, for, it's, it's you know, trying people to eat more than just bread and wheat and potatoes like we do in England. Matheus Neiver, a question Ooh. from Matheus Neiver. How can Brazil play a leadership, a leadership role in stimulating the production and trade of under, under underutilized crops, thereby contributing to global food security and reducing the hunger internationally. That's, that's cool. Um, I can't speak from a Brazilian perspective uh, due to having never visited, but I'm very keen to. Uh, in terms of a leadership role, I think Brazil has a huge uh, potential to take a, a leadership role in this, being a huge agricultural producer of several different staple food crops. Um, one of the big things that they could take a, a lead on, perhaps, is in terms of soil maintain, uh, maintaining soil fertility 
um, within agricultural systems. So implementing crop rotation of underutilized crops within rotation. So for instance, using underutilized legumes or um, you know, using all these different methods to maintain soil quality and being an example of a really good system to show the rest of the world. Because in the end of the day, Brazil is one of the biggest producers of several different staple crops. Um, so I think you have a really um, uh, a great advantage in terms of being a leader in, under, in, in, in both encouraging the production of underutilized crops, but also trade of, trade of them. It depends what the crop is, um, trade, because the scale might not be as much as the staple crops. Um, but I think in terms of production, definitely could be an example to the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, um, Sam. I, I was just thinking about like you were you were uh, giving your talk, and I I asked the guy to say, oh, think about some un unutilized crops in Brazil. So because sometimes you have a lot of unutilized crops that is from some countries that for mm -hmm. us not very uh, we use quite well. Yeah. For example. Um, in, in sometimes we think that we use that 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 crop well, but we don't. <laughs> so yeah. one, one great example in my in the the um, the region that I come from that we live here is north in the northeast. So northeast the region we have a really good tradition to produce cassava. Mm -hmm. However, we uh, five years ago we the university. Uh, make some uh, collaboration, some small communities and uh, co uh, cooperatives. And um, they find out that we produce very low amount of cassava, although oh. we eat it almost every day. Yeah. So we start work very hard to improve the cassava, the cassava production. So when I have a look at that list that you show, this cassava is, I think it's in position five mm. in the world. So, I say it's, it's it's funny because here for us it was always in the top five in our yeah. minds, but it's not. <laughs> so and we have other kinds of of um, I can I say um, roots mm -hmm. like cassava and like um, the, the guys put a lot of a lot of them here. So for us it's quite common. But when you have a look, we we have really a few. Um, how can I say the production is very small? Consider mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 eating. I cannot say, say proper. It's like part. It's part of your. It sounds like it's part yeah. of a staple diet, like traditional staple yeah. diet. Well, every day we can we can buy it, mm. but when you have a look around, we have produced very few, so mm. it doesn't make the most sense, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, in comparison to crops. So, um, and I went. I remember when I was in UK. Um, just one small market in the city, in the North City Center, you can find one place to buy this. This, this yeah, thing. you wouldn't, you wouldn't that, find. It. Yeah, that will be the African market. Mm. So when you visit, uh, I used to go there. All the Brazilians were there yeah. buying stuff. So we have a lots of like a, a, a pigeon pier. Um, I, I try to translate because you call it the the feijão guandu. It's mm. a kind of beans. So for example, in Brazil, we have loads of loads of kind of beans. Yeah, that is is very uh, unknown. A lot of Brazil they don't know about this kind of beans, and uh, it depends on the each area that we are. This it make very uh, people don't sometimes just don't know about them, and sometimes it's quite common for the people in that local. So inside, what I try to say is like it's a lot of lots of, of uh, uh, foods that we should search more about and do more work in uh, work more about them to improve the production and um, make more viable for for people because sometimes you have a crop that do, that, that uh, do not um, adapt well in some environments but when you move to another environment this can, can, could be very useful there so i think maybe, i think I think I can see two themes in what you're trying to say that I think potentially the thing with cassava in particular is that why is one of the top 10 staple crops. It seems like the export market for cassava worldwide is actually really low. Um, so cassava mm -hmm. itself is mainly produced for a domestic market in the country it's grown, um, which makes sense why you wouldn't find it in, in Nottingham city centre as much as you, know, you might do in Brazil, parts of Africa, 
um, and other places. And I agree with you, a lot of people within the country where exotic species are grown don't know about them. So I've, I've been studying in Australia for three years. And the big thing, the big exciting part of the food world there was bush tucker, which essentially is um, all sorts of things you get out in the wild um, that are edible, and they've been edible by the local people for thousands of thousands of years, but they're only just starting to become a part of the diets of people living there. And I think what tends to happen is these crops, as they're more interesting, as they're more interesting than stuff that people normally get, they become almost gourmet, and then they become more stand. They become more gourmet. They become gourmet at first, and then they slowly become standard within the, the food consumption. So quinoa, for instance, it was really fancy, and now it's a grain that's eaten in camping meals. You know, it's not exactly it, these things progress. I think. Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting about cassava. It's very interesting because, for example, here in Brazil, the uh, for example, about fermentation beer, we talk about beer here, it's quite expensive sometimes because like we don't produce uh, malt, mm. neither uh, hops, so we yeah. import them. Ah. So the price increase. So lately, it's very interesting because this happened, it started to happen in Nottingham when the, some beer production used to, um, uh, to support the the Bob's building in, in, in the Nottingham University. Um, and they, A being in Bev, they bought the, the Sun Miller. So Sun Miller usually for, is initially from South Africa, the, the company. Mm. So when the A being Bev bought the Sun Miller, they got all the knowledge and all the, 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 the technology that, that, that have been developed for years and years in South Africa. Mm. And they find out that in South Africa they produce a beer from cassava for yeah. years and years. So here in Brazil now, the AB in Bev start to open a small companies mm. to produce um, to produce a, a cassava beer. Yeah. Ah. And just to just to test the market because they don't put their name on it, you know. Say, mm. oh, let's have a look at yeah, how we'll try that side. That's very interesting. It well, we get in. So the cassava is one kind of, of crop that is on, on, in my point of view, it'll be on growing because if some, in some areas, they, they, this work well, maybe countries that you import lots and lots of hops and malt, and malt they, you, they, they start to use cassava and they start to try lots of lots of different, uh, different crops, sorry. Mm. So it's very, I think it's a very interesting thing. Yeah, I think it's very interesting. I agree. And so, and um. And this gets to to uh, uh, all the things that you, for example, here in Brazil we do about the uh, cassava as well. We have a kind of spirit that is produced just in one state, because the traditional uh, Brazilian spirit is cachaça, is produced from sugarcane. Yeah. However, we have another spirit that is produced in a modern state that they use um, a cassava for for uh, uh, to produce it as a uh, raw material. Mm. So this, this is another thing. They should work hard because cassava has lots and lots of arginine. And when you ferment it, this have a lot of high concentration of um, ethyl carbonate. Yeah. And ethyl carbonate is, is, is uh, toxic. So oh, they should work it, yeah. hard to, to, to reduce it, you know? It really so should. And when you produce exactly the, this kind of spirit, they have a really high amount of vinaces, like I mentioned uh, earlier to you. Yeah, that is both, so yeah. When you distill anything, it would be alcohol, uh, any alcoholic spirit that you distill. So we have lots of those vinaces that get exactly what you are doing now, mate. Mm. So we got all reconnected to, to the gas production. And we have, if you don't use this kind of material, you have really big impact in the, impact in the environment uh, in the future. So. You see, it's, uh, all yeah, it all intermingles. Yeah. All, uh, yeah, everything is, is connected. So we learn oh, lots of things to do. That's super interesting. So we have one more question. Perfect. 
Okay. Um, what are the criteria? I, I translate to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what are the criteria for affecting identifying a plant crop as a viable alternative source to improve food security? It's really good. That's a really good question. Um, in terms of criteria to go forward, um, I would say the primary ones are if you can have. It depends what it depends what type of crop it is. I think the main ones are if it's a cover crop and we're right, encouraging it to be a bioremediation of the soils crop, for instance, in rotation, light patch, it needs to have a large leaf coverage, it needs to have a deep rooting system, it needs to have a huge amount of biomass and a good nitro fixing potential. If we're looking at a food crop, it needs to have um, highly nutritious, nutritious seed and it needs to produce, it doesn't have to produce a high yield yet because that's what breeding programs aim to do but it needs to have a highly nutritious seed with good micronutrient content. And I think, oh, Rob, can I speak to, 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 sorry, can I speak? Not on me, unfortunately, sorry, I wanted to use that. Apologies for that, it's just, uh, yeah, never mind. Um, I think in terms of a, a grain crop, in terms of something to produce, the biomass it produces in terms of yield is an important to start with. However, the seed needs to be nutritionally analyzed for protein content, um and other sort of nutritional factors and then getting the yield up can be done afterwards so as researchers yeah it's important to look into those factors first and then increasing yield can be done exponentially through breeding programs but yeah there's a lot there's a lot to it actually it's tougher than you think there's so many um actually well, before i before i finish there is a very good study um that did a meta-analysis on uh nutritional production with underutilized crops, they did a whole, it was a great um, a great plot that looked into all these species. I think it was like nine, um, might have been a thousand species. And they basically pulled out, I think it was uh, 10 that needed utilization. I'm happy to plug that in the YouTube description afterwards, but it's very good. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, we, we, we are in the short, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> So, I, I, I like just just one, one quick question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, involving me and not all the guys. Um, some some question you you get another moment because you have a really short leash now. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking. Um, I just would, would, would ask you why you decide to to what the what the fermentation did exactly for. The two toxins that you 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 are not oh, your work. You're asking you're asking big questions. Um, <laughs> I can't I can't disclose too much about what fermentation did. I think you could probably pull the obvious from the fact there's a pattern behind it. It's done but something. This, positive. this is the It's done. Yeah, it's done something positive. Um, it's done. It's done something quite positive, which we're really excited about. I can't disclose too much on that. I'm afraid because uh, I'll get. Uh, shout it out by someone, I'm sure. But um, yeah, it's really exciting. We're pushing that forward. And yeah, hopefully that research will come forward and be developed on over the next, um, we've got we've got an embargo on it for however long. So there's a lot of things happening with that research going forward, even though I've finished the doctorate. So the lab's still going, there's still stuff happening. Um, and it's quite exciting because, you know, there, there was a grant that was given to the University of Adelaide, um, they got a, a some kind of linkage grant, ARC linkage grant between industry and um, the department I worked in with the VETCH project. And so there's a, there's quite a lot of money funneled into this project to then go and say, let's make VETCH an edible crop. And that might be for the processing side, but also that, that linkage grant included the breeding side. And that's another aspect that someone else is looking into. Um, so it, it's getting there. So it'll be, it's a positive one. I can't say too much. Yeah, uh, this 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 is really great work, and this brings a lot of great questions after. Yeah, it? it was multi so, it was multidisciplinary to say the least. Yeah, this is I think it's really Ian Fix uh, style, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think um, I think much like diversifying crops, he's diversified my work into everything. <laughs> so that's good. So Sam. Thank you very much for the, the amazing talk. You 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 drove us very well into your topic. Oh, thank it you. Was really nice to 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 hear. Yeah, you know the the guys got very excited. They asked a lot of things. Got here very early to to 
No, I appreciate everyone waking up so early. I really appreciate it. <laughs> nice. Thank you very much, guys. This Absolute was, pleasure. Uh, Samuel Riley, Dr. Samuel Riley. <laughs> yeah. And um, you, he, he, this was a little bit about the unutilized crops and how they can contribute to the global food security. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye.